We are continuing with two other acute compl complications of diabetes mellitus, which is um, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome or HHS and hypoglycemia. HHS or hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome is a life-threatening syndrome that can occur in the patient with diabetes who is able to produce just enough insulin to prevent DKA but not enough to prevent severe hyperglycemia. Osmotic diuretis, diuresis and extracellular fluid depletion. HHS is less common than DKA. It often occurs in patients older than 60 years with type 2 diabetes. Common causes of HHS are UTIs or urinary tract infections, pneumonia, sepsis, any acute illness, and newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. HHS is often re related to impaired thirst sensation and or a functional inability to replace fluids. There is usually a history of inadequate fluid intake, increasing mental depression, and polyuria. The main difference between HHS and DKA is that the patient with HHS usually has enough circulating insulin so that ketoacidosis does not occur. HHS is the result of sustained osmotic diuresis. Kidney impairment allows for extremely high blood glucose levels. Glucose impairs, concent glucose impairs the concentrating ability of the kidneys. Together with reduced volume, further reduce GFR, which again increases the blood glucose level. Because HHS produces fewer symptoms in the earlier stages, blood glucose levels can climb quite high before the problem is recognized. The higher blood glucose level increase serum osmolality and produce more severe neurological manifestations, such as somnolence, coma, seizures, hemiparesis, and aphasia. Because these manifestations resemble a stroke, immediate determination of the glucose level is critical for correct diagnosis and treatment. Lab values in HHS include a blood glucose level greater than 600 mg per deciliter and a marked increase in serum osmolality. Ketone bodies are absent or minimal in both blood and urine. HHS constitutes a medical emergency and has a high mortality rate. The administration of insulin and either normal saline or half normal saline is crucial. HHS usually necessitates greater volume of fluid replacement. This should be accomplished slowly and carefully. Patients with HHS are commonly older and may have cardiac or renal compromise, necessitating hemodynamic monitoring to avoid fluid overload during fluid replacement. When blood glucose levels fall to approximately 250 mg per deciliter, IV fluids containing glucose are administered to prevent hypoglycemia. Electrolytes are monitored and replaced as needed. Hypokalemia is not as significant in HHS as it is in DKA, although fluid losses may result in milder potassium deficits that necess necessitate replacement. Assess vital signs, intake and output, tissue turgor, lab values, and cardiac monitoring to check the efficacy of fluid and electrolyte replacement. The, this includes monitoring of serum osmolality and frequent assessment of cardiac, renal, and mental status. Once the patient is stabilized, attempts to detect and correct the underlying precipitating cause should be initiated. Nursing management of both DKA and HHS. Closely monitor blood glucose and urine for output and ketones as well lab data to determine appropriate patient care. Monitor the administration of IV fluids to correct dehydration, insulin therapy to reduce blood glucose and serum acetone levels, and electrolytes given to correct electrolyte imbalance. Assess the renal status and the cardiopulmonary status related to hydration and electrolyte levels. Monitor the level of consciousness, 
assess for signs of potassium imbalance resulting from hypoinsulinemia and osmotic diuresis. When treatment with insulin begins, serum potassium levels may decrease rapidly as potassium moves into the cells once insulin becomes available. This movement of potassium into and out of extracellular fluid influences cardiac functioning. Cardiac monitoring is useful in detecting hyperkalemia and hypokalemia because characteristic changes indicates, uh, indicating potassium excess or deficit are observable on EKG tracings. Assess vital signs often to determine the presence of fever, hypovolemic shock, tachycardia, and Kussmaul's respirations. The next complication is hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia or low blood glucose level occurs when there is too much insulin in proportion to available glucose in the blood. This causes the blood glucose level to drop to less than 70 mg per deciliter. When plasma glucose level drops below 70, neuroendocrine hormones are released and the autonomic nervous system is activated. Epinephrine release causes manifestations that includes shakiness, palpitations, nervousness, diaphoresis, anxiety, hunger, and pallor. Because the brain requires a constant supply of glucose in sufficient quantities to function properly, hypoglycemia can affect mental functioning. The manifestations are speaking difficulties, visual disturbances, stupor, confusion, and coma. Manifestations of uh, hypoglycemia can mimic those of alcohol intoxication. Untreated hypoglycemia can result to loss of consciousness, seizures, coma, and death. Hypoglycemia unawareness. Hypoglycemic unawareness is a condition in which a person does not experience the warning signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia until the glucose levels reach a critical point. When the person may become incoherent and combative or lose consciousness, this is often related to autonomic neuropathy of diabetes that interferes with the secretion of counter-regulatory hormones that produce these symptoms. Patients at risk for hypoglycemic unawareness include those who have had repeated episodes of hypoglycemia, older patients, and patients who use beta-adrenergic blockers. Using intensive treatment to get tight blood glucose control in patients who are at risk for hypoglycemic unawareness may not be an appropriate goal because a major drawback is hypoglycemia. These patients are usually managed with blood glucose goals that are somewhat higher than those of patients who are able to detect and manage the onset of hypoglycemia. The causes of hypoglycemia. They are often related to a mismatch in the timing of food intake and the peak action of insulin or oral hypoglycemic agents that increase the endogenous insulin secretion. The balance between blood glucose and insulin can be disrupted by administering too much insulin or medication or ingesting too little food, delaying the time of eating and performing unusual amounts of exercise. Hypoglycemia can occur at any time, but most episodes occur when the hypoglycemic agent or insulin is at its peak of action or when the patient's daily routine is disrupted without adequate adjustments in diet, medications, and activity. Although hypoglycemia is more common with insulin therapy, it can occur with other hypoglycemic agents and it may be severe and persist for an ex extended time because of the longer duration of action of the oral hypoglycemic agents. Hypoglycemic symptoms may occur when a very high blood glucose level falls too rapidly. Although the blood glucose level is above normal by definition and measurement, the sudden metabolic shift can evoke hypoglycemic symptoms. Overly vigorous management of hyperglycemia with insulin can cause this type of situation. 
Hypoglycemia can usually be quickly reversed with effective treatment. At the first sign of hypoglycemia, check the blood glucose level if possible. If it is less than 70 mg per deciliter, immediately begin treatment for hypoglycemia. If the blood glucose is greater than 70, investigate other possible causes of the signs and symptoms. If the patient has manifestations of hypoglycemia and monitoring equipment is not available or the patient has a history of chronic poor glycemic control, hypoglycemia should be assumed and treatment should be initiated. Follow the rule of 15 to treat hypoglycemia. A blood glucose level less than 70 is treated by ingestion of 15 gram of simple fast-acting carbohydrate such as 4 to 6 ounce of fruit juice or a regular soft drink. Commercial products such as gels or tablets containing specific amounts of glucose are convenient for carrying in a purse or pocket to be used in such situations. Recheck the blood glucose level 15 minutes later. If the value is still less than 70 mg per deciliter, ingest 15 grams more of the carbohydrate and recheck the blood sugar in 15 minutes. If there is no significant improvement in the patient's condition after 2 to 3 doses of 15 grams of simple carbohydrate, contact the healthcare provider. Because of the potential for rebound hypoglycemia after an acute episode, have the patient ingest a complex carbohydrate after recovery to prevent another hypoglycemic attack. Avoid treatment with carbohydrates that contain fat such as candy bars, cookies, whole milk and ice cream. The fat in these foods will slow down the absorption of the sugar and delay the response to treatment. Avoid over-treatment with large quantities of quick-acting carbohydrates so that a rapid fluctuation to hyperglycemia does not occur. Treatment In an acute care setting, patients with hypoglycemia may be treated with 20 to 50 ml of 50% dextrose IV push. Another option of the patient is not if the patient is not alert enough to swallow and no IV access is available is to administer 1 mg of glucagon by intramuscular or subcutaneous injection. An IM injection in a site such as the deltoid muscle will result in a quicker response. Glucagon stimulates a strong hepatic response to convert glycogen to glucose and therefore makes glucose readily available. Nausea is a common reaction after gluco glucagon injection. Therefore, to prevent aspiration if vomiting occurs, turn the patient on the side until he or she becomes alert. Once the acute hypoglycemia has been reversed, explore with the patient the reasons why the situation developed. This assessment may indicate the need for additional teaching of the patient and the family to avoid future episodes of hypoglycemia. In summary, the acute complications of diabetes mellitus are DKA, HHS and hypoglycemia. DKA and HHS are effects of hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia is the effect of low blood sugar. All three of them need emergency management to prevent long-term deficiencies and or depth.